um, today is July 18th. It is 3.30 Pacific time. If that is the time on your calendar, then you are joining us live and you can interact with us. If it's not, you're, you're watching. You're watching an archive. <laughs> and we don't do time travel yet. We're trying. Yes. We really are trying. But we, we will don't. have the lottery numbers momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> so you're joining the Technomania monthly live video chat. And we are joined with our guest stars. Do you want to be stars? We're stars, Host? sure. Co-hosts? We'll be guest hosts. Yeah. Yeah. Who are these guys? So this is uh, Peter and John of the RV Geeks. I'm Peter. If you put your hands up, they might recognize you. Yes, this is the only part of me that's famous. My voice in my hands. And the backs. Yes, yeah. the backs of the hands. Yes. <laughs> so so the, for the RV Geeks, for those who have not run across them, um, they are the top YouTube channel for do-it-yourself RV videos. They are kings on YouTube. Thank you, and everyone. They are famous for never showing their faces <laughs> until now. So that's well, why. Famous hands, famous voice, they've never been seen until... We, well, faces for radio, but hands for right. YouTube. <laughs> so we're here in Vancouver, British Columbia. We are on our return trip from our amazing Alaska adventure. If you've been following the blog and what we've been up to, we will have a video out on that soon as well about our experience. But we met with these guys on our way up, had a fabulous time, and just decided we needed more time with them. Our uh, Stephen, the back here, fielding the questions for us, uh, runs the RV Summit. We had the opportunity to meet up with him and his lovely wife, Ellen. And we just loved all four of them so much that we booked another week in Vancouver to spend more time. And here we all together. Yeah, I just nice love bringing my friends together. It's Welcome just, back. It's awesome. So Welcome back. So we've been having a wonderful time here in Vancouver. They are full-time RVers. We are. 12 years, 12 years. Uh, this past April, yes. Um, so this is, we're obviously not in an RV. And this makes it a very topical thing for us to talk about, is what do you do with your RV when you do non-RV travels? Right. And uh, they're visiting in from, they have a, a spot just outside of town. Um, about an hour and a half from here in the Fraser Valley. And so they came in for the weekend. Um, we're obviously on like a two month plus journey without our RV. <laughs> so we're kind of coming from two different styles of leaving your RV behind. Short term, um, long term. And we're renting this glorious apartment on, we found it, Peter found it on Airbnb. Airbnb, yeah. And uh, we've rented it for the weekend so that we could have some time together. And we've just been having a ball. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Vancouver. <laughs> yes. Um, so. Today's topic, uh, the way if you've joined one of these before, we're going to babble on for about 20 or 30 minutes about various things. We'll talk about the topic and then we will open it up to questions and answers. Today's topic is about leaving that RV behind. Yeah. And, and what are some, I mean, we're all full time RVers, so th and there are times that we travel without our RV. Yeah, for any number of reasons. Yeah. Family, family emergencies, trips to see family, trips abroad, going to the grocery store. <laughs> Going to a place, <laughs> coming, a short, coming short to a major emotion. city that yes. you might want to stay in the downtown area. To meet up with friends. Yes. Yeah. Right. And yeah, we, sometimes our games actually take vacations. We do. Yes. <laughs> sometimes uh, actually we do, yeah. Without our RV. Full-time RV is not a full-time vacation. Sometimes it's nice to do things other than RV. And another popular reason that, especially for a lot of the younger RVers heading the road today, is they might need to fly out for work. Um, whether meetings or meeting up with their team, going to a conference, and it's just too far to drive the RV. So there's times you might want to park the RV and fly away or train or drive um, to go to a meeting. Um, this doesn't just apply to full-time RVers, however. Yeah, a lot uh, of seasonal people. Yeah, yeah, you could be out on a vacation RV and you might need to fly away for an emergency. Absolutely right. Um, if you're a seasonal RVer, you might need to, well, you're probably going to well, be parking. Well, the, the, seasonal, park. the season yeah. ends, and so you're like, wrapping it up to come back next summer or next winter. Right, right. some of the things we'll talk about may apply simply to putting your RV in storage as a planned activity for not using it for the winter. Right, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, when one of these situations occurs, where are some places that one might think about leaving their RV? Friends are great. <laughs> we love friends. Yeah. 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 Friends with <laughs> large properties are the best. Exactly. And but no RV ordinances. <laughs> and, and the advantage of, of parking with friends is you've got a built-in watch, somebody who cares about you and cares hopefully about your RV, to just keep an eye on things, which is great. Yeah, it's a great peace of mind for yourself while you're gone. So yes, we do have a lot. We, we don't just make friends if they have property, <laughs> but... Yes, they do. We do too. <laughs> we all, it never hurts. But we do actually, it, it is such a blessing that we have a network of friends across the country that have always made the open invite that if we need to fly away, we can. And we did that when Chris and I moved to the Virgin Islands four years ago, five years ago. Uh, we were able to leave our RV with a friend on this property, 
near the airport that we were flying out from, and it made it super convenient for us to come home uh, when we were done with that adventure. We're in the lucky situation of having a lot of customers that have RV parks because we design uh, websites for RV parks, and it is not uncommon when we fly out for three weeks to a month at a time or longer to visit family, we can park in their parks. That happens quite a bit. But if, you, if you're not so fortunate to have a friend who has property or is nearby and close to the car travels that you're on, uh, RV park socks can uh, make a good option. If it's a short trip, right. just pay the, the stay, monthly fee. Stay in a site. Right. Yeah, exactly. well, a lot of RV parks also have dedicated storage facilities where the cost to keep your RV is less than actually keeping it on a site. But of course, you are not going to have power hookup. So if you don't have solar panels and you are concerned about your batteries, you might be willing to pay for a site for a month. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and even the RV parks that don't have storage yards, sometimes in the off season, if you just say, hey, you know, I, I need to go away for a month, I'm not going to be here, can I make you a deal? Mm -hmm. And we've known friends who've had that sort of negotiation and they've been able to stay in a site, plug in, keep their fridge going, and pay a fraction of the rate. And the, and the owner season. knows that they're not running uh, their air right. conditioners right. and the heaters and things like that. It's yeah. just basic power that's being used. So they're yeah. willing to, Offer it for a lower cost. Uh, there's, there's one time where we booked a week-long cruise with my parents, and uh, we got a monthly spot in the area, just knowing that a week of that was going to be while we're away, and that gave us a base camp before and after that trip to pack and unpack. Yeah, right. And the base, the discount of the monthly spot paid for paid that, for yeah, 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 one week of nine days. Um, so Kevin of uh, uh, the New Orleans group, he wrote me last night and said that the Escapees group, uh, they have at their Livingston campground, they will they have RV storage there and they just charge a dollar per day um, for up to 90 days. So that's another option for the Very escapees members. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, the good reason to join escapees. Mm -hmm. um, there, and then the, there's RV storage lots. I mean, storage some RV parks have storage lots and then there's RV storage lots. Right, right. exactly. Right. Storage units that sometimes have The, the first time we ever left our RV for a length of time was during a family emer emergency about 11 years ago. And it was inside storage where we pulled into a storage facility, plugged into power to keep the batteries charged, and locked the door. It was the best possible thing. A little more expensive, but it was a lot of peace of mind. And for yeah. us as new RVers at the time, it was absolutely an element of the peace of mind of not really knowing you know, some of the aspects of where we were or what we were dealing with. And having it secured like that was just really great. Very rare. Yeah. And then you can do what we're doing. We wanted to go on vacation. We wanted a big vacation. <laughs> we we scheduled it while we're doing some RV. So our RV is being fully renovated right now, repainted, and a whole bunch of projects being done. Uh, but you can find like if it's due for its annual maintenance or you want to do an upgrade, find an RV shop that can do the work while you need to be away. You're getting free storage. Yeah, and a lot of times, even if the job is only a one week job and you're going to be gone a month. They'll just throw in the rest of the storage for free after the project. Or, or, or minimal, minimal cost. And right. well, yeah, because you're giving them a lot of flexibility of saying you could adjust when you do the work over mm -hmm. this span of time. So you give them spare time work and um, it works out. It's win-win for everybody. Yeah. And that also applies differently depending on the season too. Yes. If you have prime okay. season, that's a big factor yeah. for yeah. them being able to have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. So there's some ideas of uh, where to leave it. Now, once you've got it where you're going, um, what should you do to the RV to make sure that when you come home, you don't have a stinky fridge or, <laughs> or an overflooded block tank? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All icky stuff that at least most of us by the smiles have probably encountered at least once. <laughs> yeah. Bad things can happen if you leave your RV, right? And uh, yes. so try yeah. to avoid them. So um, some of the considerations, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Like you guys preparing for this three-day adventure versus us preparing for two months away are completely different. Totally different. Yeah. Totally different preparations. You're not going to go to the extremes we did Absolutely um, to come back from. So that's the first consideration. How long are you going to be away and right. what is worthwhile doing on this, this list that we'll be going over of ideas to do to keep your RV safe? Right, right. Uh, the storage location. Where is it going to be stored? So, of those places that we just talked about, where is it going to be stored? It's going to have an impact on. Right. Correct. Right. Is 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 it going to get rained on? Is there storm potential? Is there vandalism potential? Are there rodents, insects that might yeah. invade right. the RV? Right. Is there? And then, very very important, is there freezing potential? Right. That's one of the biggest factors. Length of time, and how low will the temperature go? Mm -hmm. uh, and also, will someone be checking the unit? Will you have feedback, or do you have some sort of remote monitoring 
that you can do. <laughs> Some people have technology that allows them to see their RVs when they are anywhere in the world. Not all of us have that. No. So, yeah, so got, Chris is logging to see the, the status of our, of our batteries right now. Well, this is security cameras inside our, our bus being worked on. It's, I can you know, monitor what's going on live because we left behind, actually we're using an app called Presence that uses spare iPhones that if you get them online via either Wi-Fi hotspot or a cellular connection, you can connect to them and see what's going on in your rig and they'll record motion and send you emails of, hey, there's people fluffing our pillows. Um, <laughs> why? Why? I want to know why I'm, Master Tech is fluffing my pillows. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think Sawdust so, got them so in there. They're preparing for your return. There we go. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And then here's our battery status. Our, our Victron inverter and battery monitor actually talks to the internet so I can see how our battery is doing, which is very critical because a lot of times, even if you leave your RV plugged in, if it gets disconnected or a circuit blows, um, bad, bad things can happen if your battery is drained down from having the fridge on or having a vent going or having just a light you left on. You could end up with bad and uh, drained and damaged batteries. Um, so actually having a little peace of mind and being able to say, oh yeah, our batteries are doing just fine. And it's great. This is certainly the highest end <laughs> on the spectrum of monitoring your motorhome. This is as good as it gets. Absolutely. I think we could do better. We could do better. I've got better plans. We could have a drone that, de that deploys from the roof Remote when we want to control. and actually do a fly around. There you go. With missiles? Maybe. With missiles, so <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're getting crazy. We're getting crazy. <laughs> I have some upgrades in mind that, okay. are, that don't but Probably not. You yeah. might just have someone go look at your RV. Yeah. That's and your check option the power. Yes. yes, but if you don't have that option, you know, you just have to be good with there might be stuff happening to your RV that you don't know about. Um, so I made a checklist, and then these guys, we all kind of bashed our heads together over sushi and ice cream yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily in that order. <laughs> Sushi and ice cream. Well, yeah. Sushi yeah. ice cream is not so good. No, yeah. rice, yeah. And fish, and ice yeah. cool. um, is uh, a checklist of things to do. So I was thinking that we could go with uh, weather-related things first. Right. What uh, if it's going to be cold and freezing? What should I, I've right. never been in cold. Well, we you know we we had our first experience being full time and primarily snowbirds in the desert southwest. During the winter, and our RV is very rarely exposed to freezing temperatures, and when it has, we've been on board. This past winter, we left the RV in British Columbia while we flew to the East Coast for two months. It was the very first time ever that we have winterized our RV in the 12 years we've been doing this, and we blew out the water lines and had to deal with freeze prevention issues. Right. So that's the, maybe the most important thing that would cause damage is freezing temperatures, but also uh, we had an experience in Texas where severe weather came through while we were gone and blew yeah. out the pilot light. Yeah, exactly. So ah. on the on the refrigerator, on the refrigerator. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And we came back to everything melted. Hmm. Poor ice cream. Poor yeah, exactly. <laughs> <You're not kidding. laughs> that was a very disappointing return. Yes. Right. So definitely with winter, follow your winterization. Whatever you do, to leave it for winter. Um, if you don't know what to do, I think you guys have a video on winterizing, don't you? Or someone does. Oh, yeah. yeah we and, do. and check your RV manuals. If you have a commercial RV, they almost always have a big checklist that comes with them of here's how to rent mm -hmm. the water. Because every RV's got different low points that you need to know where they are in right. line to get the water out of them. Yes. Um, you also need to be prepared for high winds that might pop up. So probably leaving the awnings in or out. Which, which way, way do you? Well, uh, again, for a long term, we always put slides in, put the awnings in, make sure everything's all secure. But right. you know, for short term, for this weekend, um, again, being aware of the environment of where you are leaving the RV, because we have great experience with the weather here, we were comfortable with leaving our window awnings out in order to help provide shade and keep it cooler inside while we're not there. But, but main awnings, main awnings. Even, even, awnings. even if your trip is just to the grocery store, right. if you're someplace that is prone to thunderstorms, it is. They can pop up almost anywhere at any time. In certain even in the with Midwest. a wind sensor. Yes. Yeah, so even if the wind sensor and a, a big right. gust of wind on the storm front in just a matter of moments can rip the awning off your RV and do thousands of dollars of damage. So shut the main awning. Your window awnings can probably survive all but the worst possible storms, right. but your main awning is a big sail. Shut it when you're gone for more for out of sight. Well, right. Right. whenever we're out of sight of our RV, even for an hour, we don't leave our awning out. It's just, 
Well, it's just too much risk, and the mm -hmm. damage it would be caused by a wind gust is just so severe, right? Put it right up on top of the RV. Right, that you, can, you can do big scratches in the RV. Yeah, that's, that's one right. of the things we're having repaired is um, a prior owner of our bus had, the awning had blown off. And that big scratch scratches going up the, the sides. So we're trying to, damage for that. So yeah. we're trying to undo some of that but damage with this. But we're going for three days now. Our window awnings are out. Thunderstorms here are very rare. If we were, say, in uh, the plain states right now, where during this time of year there could be tornadoes or thunderstorms, we wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Uh, so if you're leaving it in a cold environment, and do, do you run your heat while you're away? If you don't want to winterize, yeah. then yeah, that's what you should do. Right? And how safe is that, like running like a propane furnace when you're not there? Um, I don't know. I think that's a, there's a, a fair amount of that that's sort of personal comfort level. You know, obviously there's a whole spectrum of people who will shut their propane off for a lot of reasons. We personally are comfortable with doing right. that, uh, leaving it running in in the event of just keeping it warm when needed. We, if we didn't want to winterize and we were away for maybe a week and weren't going long enough to make it worth blowing the water lines out in full winterization, we would have no problem leaving our heat set to say 40 degrees or 45 degrees with the propane furnace and the basement heat turned on. And we, we're lucky we have basement heat. If you don't and you have water pipes down there, you need to take other measures. Uh, right. Trouble like 60 watt bulb. Yeah. All right, and then there's uh, ventilation is another weather related thing. Right. Um, you don't want it to get all sticky and yeah, humid in there or to, to build up, you want some ventilation going. Yeah, exactly, just from a mustiness smell perspective, nobody wants to come home to that odor, but the other obviously being just an issue of uh, humidity and temperature changes right. can cause condensation that leads to mold buildup and damage that you don't want to really have accrue over time. But how do we leave our fans set? Uh, we left one of the fans open on, and on thermostat, so uh, right. you know, it has a rain sensor. If it were to get windy and blustery, it will close, so at least we don't have to worry about water penetration. Right. But it is set to come on at 90 I degrees. I think it to 90 degrees. If it gets more than 90 degrees, the fan will come on. Just to help yeah. ventilate some heat, heat out of the RV and pull some fresh air in through uh, whatever openings it can get. Right. Okay. Right. Should we uh, maybe cover water systems next? Seems like a sure. Sure. Yeah, right. impression. Yeah. Uh, tanks. What do you do with your tanks? <laughs> she asks <laughs> ominously. Uh, Again, it, it, well, for a longer trip, you're better off leaving your, your tanks empty because you don't want to leave your, your black and gray tanks because you don't want to leave that stuff but, stewing. But you want to wash them, you want to do a, a flush or two right. beforehand if you've got some sort of washing mechanism that can do the zoo 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 inside. Um, <laughs> is that a thing, right? Yes, <laughs> zoo 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 zoo. That's the thing you should have on the toilet. You want to do a good wash on it because you. The last thing you also want to do is if you empty all the water out of the tanks and there's still stuff left in the bottom, yeah, um, you don't dry. want that getting dried and cracked on there either. You want right, to get as right. much of that out of there as possible if you're going to leave it dry for a while. One thing we've done when we've left for, say, a week or so, we've taken advantage of the fact that we're not using the black and gray tanks. We've emptied them and flushed them out and filled them with water and put in some sort of treatment to nice. soak them for a week while we're gone. So we typically will put in a uh, water softener like uh, 20 mule team borax, put in a couple of cups of that, mix it all in, or Happy Camper is another thing that will super happy clean. Yeah. Happy Camper is a great product that will break down all solid waste, and if you leave it soaking for a week while you're gone, you're taking advantage of your absence that to clean your tank. Is great, yeah, great advice. Yeah. And especially since you can fill the tank completely and actually get all the stuff that's been caking up and drying on the side. Maybe your sensors might work next time. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the one thing you do want to make sure you do when you're leaving for a long period of time, even potentially for a short period of time, is turn off any sort of city water connection you have because very bad things can happen to your RV <laughs> if something breaks and that city water starts flowing through your RV. If a pipe freezes and cracks or just a, a seal starts to seep, just that breaks. will be weeks and weeks of water going until you get a phone call from somebody saying, why is there a waterfall coming down the steps of your RV? Right. And that, that can actually destroy an RV if it happens long enough. While we are gone for this trip, so we turned off the water and we turned off the propane. And those were, we, we also turned off the water heater so those are the three main things we did to be gone for a three-day weekend. We turned off the water, the propane, and the water heater, and that was most of what we did. What about your pump, water pump? Uh, that was one of the things. <laughs> we actually pulled the fuse on ours, um, partly because we have a, an electric toilet. And unfortunately, there are situations where those electric toilets can short and trigger, and we'll begin to pump and pump and pump and pump if the yeah. water source is available. So right. we wanted to avoid the potential for coming home to 
a fully filled black tank, since our fresh yeah. tank holds 105 gallons. So yeah, you, you, you do the math. You have 105 <laughs> gallons of fresh water, and you have a black tank that holds 45. Hmm. It Which means the toilet goes on the fritz. If the toilet right. just begins to pump, an electric toilet simply begins to pump, it's going to put 45 gallons of water in there, and the other 65 gallons is going to come up and out and into the yard. And then once your pump runs dry, your pump will probably burn out. Your pump will burn I, out. I, I would think that if your, your black tank has overflowed, you have bigger problems than worrying about your pump. Yes. Well, not, pump not if you flush flushed it out first. <laughs> yes, at least. No. Yes. If you flushed it out first, so, then it won't be that. As far as freshwater tanks, for a short trip, you leave yours full, and you, you just unconnect the fuel pump. Water, 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 are you going to be comfortable drinking the water when you get back? Anyway? You're, gonna, you're gonna want to flush right. it out anyway. So you're probably gonna do a full sanitization. You'll probably sanitize. And again, a lot of this depends on how long are you going to be gone. Three days, three months, it's a big difference. And, and sometimes you leave, you don't know exactly how long you're gonna be gone. You like in your situation, you guys right. left out not knowing Correct. how long you're gonna be for your family emergency. Well, and so during, during the 12 years we've been on the road, both of our fathers have passed away during that time. And when that sort of family emergency comes up, not only are you going for an unknown amount of time to be with your family if they're a long way away, but you're usually leaving on less than 24 hours notice. So yes. that requires rapid steps, emptying and cleaning the tanks and doing everything for an unknown trip. Okay. There are two other things you guys mentioned yesterday that we hadn't thought of doing before. One was putting baking soda into all the pea traps, which are the, the drains where it, the water goes the, 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 <laughs> Like the shape it. of a pea. Yeah, the, the U. The U. Yes. Um, they're really so, U-traps. I don't know why they're called P-traps, it's a U-traps. Um, but you put some baking soda down there and that's to eliminate any smells, right? Yeah, it does. It just seems, for again, from our experience, it seems to... Yeah, it smells like a bloodhound. So. Yeah, face to match. But um, the, <laughs> it really does, for us, seem to help with uh, preventing any odors when we return to the RV. And, uh, you know, again, it's sort of a small step to take. We have the baking soda in the refrigerator. If we are going to be gone for long enough that we're worried about this issue, we're shutting the refrigerator down. We've got this thing of baking soda, and it sprinkles into all of the, the drinks. Another big question, will you shut your refrigerator down and empty it? And right. we, of course, have not to be gone for three days. The longer you're going to be gone, the more likely you're going to empty your refrigerator and shut right. it off. Yes. Because just always think through the worst case scenario of imagine what happens to your RV if the power goes out or, or your the fridge or, pilot burns out. Or if the or, propane runs out, if you're running it on propane while you're gone. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and, and even if you think it's someplace that it's safe and being watched um, by a friend and stuff, they might not realize that like the one particular circuit burned out. And actually, we saw this happen recently of an RV had half one bank of power went out because of a shore power fuse blew on one bank of a 50 amp circuit. And they had a full mm -hmm. fridge of meat. Full oh, fridge. Wow. It was and they had to oh, go in to clean it. I know who that was. I read that on the blog. <laughs> <laughs> it was Ben, wasn't it? No, no, no. That, that happened him years ago. Yeah. We, we know this has happened many times to many people. Right. Even if you think you've got generator auto start, even if you think you, I mean, Think through the worst case scenario because it might happen while you're gone. Right. Being plugged into power is all well and good, but if the power fails or the circuit blows, what's your backup? And is there somebody who's going to be noticing that and fix right. it for you? And what's your risk tolerance zone? Obviously for three days, getting rid of all your food <laughs> in your fridge is not, you have to be pretty <laughs> on the other end of the risk tolerance zone right. to want to go and empty your fridge for that. We're leaving, of course, for two plus months. We emptied out the fridge, that was part of it. Everything goes. And we also did a thorough cleaning of everything in the RV. We made sure there was no spare rice kernels in the pantry. That we attract mice. Yeah. We didn't, wanted to reduce the chances of attracting insects, mice, right. and rodents, or anything that might grow mold or mildew. Right. Well, if I could get back one second for one tip that you mentioned about putting baking soda in the pea traps. One other thing we do before we leave the RV is we make sure we run, right before we go, we run water down the pea traps uh, down into the sinks and we run the washing machine right before we go we try and do laundry and the reason you're doing this is you are going to have evaporation from your pea traps mm -hmm. and as soon as the water evaporates from the pea traps whether it's under the sinks or in the uh, washing machine now odors are going to be allowed to get back into the rv from the gray tank so and that can dampen your excitement about being home <laughs> right. that's, that's not going to be something that's damaging but it's it's just nice to stop that 
It's nice to come home to a, a welcoming right. house. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. And also, we fill the toilet when we're gone for very long. We fill the toilet about halfway with fresh water. Okay, with water. Good. Yeah. With fresh water. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point, Chris. Thank you, for, thank you for the clarification. We, we put fresh water into the toilet about halfway, and you'll find when you come back after being gone for two or three months that that most or sometimes all of that water has evaporated down, and you'll see a little brown mark down in there. And what you're doing is, again, that water is the barrier between the gray tank and the inside of the RV. Yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wow, <laughs> 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 very different than the <laughs> Buses are completely different. <laughs> Regular RVs, black, gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just mix it all up. Your, your black tank, obviously, is right under the toilet, and if you <laughs> seal that off with water, it's right. going to make sure that any black tank smells don't get up in the RV. Right. Yes. So. Cool. So I think it covers water pretty well. Yep. Yes. yep. Let's go talk about some electrical. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> electrical. Right. First question, are you plugged in or not? Yes. Are you plugged in? Do you have so, so solar panels or not? Right. Do you have a generator with an auto start? Yeah. Start. And, and if you're going to be gone long enough, is it making sense to actually put your battery into disconnected switch, switched off mode, which is, in a lot of cases, is the safe thing to do if you're not needing power on board. But Chris didn't want to do that because he wanted to remote in and show off to people that he could <laughs> show the status of his batteries. So. <laughs> we, left, we left our batteries on because we have our uh, backup QNAP drive in our RV turned on. If we need to remote access our computer files while we're here, we can do that right from here because we have to try to keep up with, the <laughs> the 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 tech tech with technology. So if we want to get on our RV's computer system from here, we can. Yes. But not without power. Right. Okay. Right. Yes. And you know, as another point is, are you going to leave some internet behind in your RV if you're doing any of this remote stuff? Right. right. You know, do you have a, an internet connection left that you can stay there? I mean, that's essential for us. We left. What did we? Because well, we're on Master Tech's Wi-Fi, right? Yeah, we're on Master Tech's Wi-Fi at the moment. But if we were away, we would leave one of our internet sources back in the RV mm. and then take one with us. So if we maybe would leave the Verizon, we'd take the at t or whatever made sense for the trip so that we could remote back in. Mm. Best thing to do, if you have it available, plug into power, trickle charging the batteries, providing power for things like that. And if we, when we park in places where we don't have power, like in a storage yard, we keep our solar panels trickle charging our batteries the entire time. All right. So we're reaching kind of the, the end of our talk here. Right. We'll have one, a couple more points that we'll be making. If you do have questions, I'm sure some of you have been queuing them up. Steven's giving me a nod over there. <laughs> um, so go ahead and, and if you've been holding out on asking questions, go ahead and start queuing them up and we'll be happy to address them for you. And uh, they can be about this topic or anything about RV, nomadism, life on the road, anything you want to ask the four of us. You've got 22, 23 years here of combined RV experience. experience. Wow. Um, so, you know, feel More free. More than if you'd count each of us. If each of us. Yeah. Oh, now we're into the hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the, we had a couple other just general stuff. We already covered um, fridge, if you clean up the fridge or not. So, right. uh, and yeah. cleaning up the RV. So that kind of got integrated into there. Um, ventilation, we did talk about, but also tire covers. You had some interesting points on protecting your tires while you're away. Right. Well, the uh, obviously when you're Park for any period of time. Uh, you want to have tire covers on, you want to protect them from the sun. We've talked about tires so many times in our videos about protecting them and how expensive they are to replace and what a valuable resource they are. And cover them. One way or another, cover them over. But also, if you're parked for a period of time on asphalt or grass or dirt particularly, you want to put a barrier down prior to parking on them. If you're on concrete, that's not a problem because we're talking about the chemicals in asphalt leaching compounds from the rubber and damaging the tire, or if you're aging. Right, and if you're parked on grass or dirt. It's the same, it's actually a moisture issue. Again, mm -hmm. leaching chemicals out and doing damage to the tires that will just prematurely age them. So what right. material do you put down? Uh, the easiest thing to do is to get yourself some cheap, thin cutting boards from Amazon or Walmart or wherever for a couple of bucks and Put them right in front of your tires and drive your RV onto them and they're so big and your tires are now sitting on this cheap plastic barrier that you can, you can throw them away afterward if you want to. That's a really inexpensive way to go. Good. Good tip. All right. Was there anything else on the list you guys wanted to cover? Because that kind of, I think we, we got the checklist. So I, was going to to go. <laughs> I was uh, actually going to just jump back to the electrical aspect, okay. which was um, I know we've sort of shot ourselves in the foot with our auto gen start is new to us and we installed it after the fact so we always have a learning curve mm -hmm. 
um, being aware of what your auto gen start is set to if you are stored inside, having your generator fire up while the RV is in storage indoors could be a problem. And also just being aware of what its settings are because again, if you're relying on it, make sure it's programmed properly. And right. Also on the electrical front, a lot of people aren't very aware of how much power their various things and circuits in their rig use. And they think, oh, I turned off, turned off everything, but actually almost most commercial RVs have um, that have propane systems have a, a propane leak detector. Mm -hmm. That is always using a little bit of power and they think, oh, I turned everything off before I left for a trip. And if they don't have solar or some other trickle charge, they might come back and their batteries are completely dead and shot because that little monitor ran for two, two or three months straight, drained their battery down and killed it. And the worst thing you can do to batteries is to drain them. And even, drain even one time is damaging to drain, right. drain your RV batteries down and shorten their life. And so do what you need to to stop that from happening, whether it's being plugged in or, or having a full or, or having a full battery cut off if you're going to be gone long enough that you that think that might be an issue. Right. And unexpected things can happen. We had our RV stored at a customer's park about nine years ago and got a little bit of a nervous phone call from the manager while we were away telling us that our auto gen start had fired up and our generator was running and how to shut it off. And that was news to us. Because we didn't have an auto gen start at the time. <laughs> and we, we installed that later than that. And what had happened was a short occurred. Mm -hmm. And so keep in mind things like that. If we had simply turned off the main disconnect at the chassis batteries, that couldn't have happened because that's what powers the generator right. starter. But, uh, you know, sort of one of our mantras is it's not necessary, it's not the likelihood it's the consequence of <laughs> yes, something exactly. going wrong. So right. even though it may seem like it's a long shot for something to go wrong, you know, long shots happen. It's exactly why we pull the fuse from the water pump while we're going. It's not the likelihood <laughs> that it would spontaneously short out and hard. fire up. Mm -hmm. It's the consequences of what would happen yeah. if it did. It's cool. I think we're ready to move into the Q&A section. Yeah. Uh, beforehand, oh. we should probably have some wine. Oh, that's yeah, important. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, um, so we, we, have, we, have, we have a special wine. Uh, this. There is a type of wine here in British Columbia uh, that's typically referred to as VQA, and that is wines that are not only bottled here in British Columbia, but the grapes are grown here. It is a truly British Columbia uh, product. And this is a bottle of Jackson Triggs Merlot, which uh, we brought to celebrate this weekend with Chris and Shuri, and I'd like to present that to you. Oh, thank you guys so much. Usually we, uh, we ask our, we do these video chats as a gift to to the RVing community, we hope that they're very useful and it's our pleasure to all of us gift our time. Um, we do love your comments, we love your thanks. Please don't hold back on that. Um, leave comments on here, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're viewing this at, and we will all read them and we'll all appreciate them. Um, also, if you would like to fund a bottle of wine or the <laughs> emergency internet we had to purchase to do this live cast. We, um, we had to buy some Canadian internet we, to do this. To do this. <laughs> very uh, feel free to, there is a donate button on the bottom of technomadia.com and also the RV Geeks have a donate button on their page. If you appreciate this information and it's useful to you, we do, we never expect, but we all very just accept. We all appreciate it. We all it. Appreciate. So. Thank you. Yes. So our, our uh, PA here is going to pour us some glasses. And our production assistant. Oh yeah, this is going to be good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So our, our production assistant is also going to be our wine <laughs> Yes. Uh, should we introduce our production assistant yes, here? Yes, we should. Oh, give him oh, camera right. time here. Yeah, so this is uh, Stephen. He ran the RV Summit, if you caught that, back in May. Uh, he and his wife, Ellen, they interviewed, we had about 40 interviews that you went live with? Yeah, that's right. They interviewed 40 different RVers and travelers from around the world and did an audio recording and offered them for free for a week. And my understanding is that's going to continue back? Or come back continue, yeah, we'll be releasing more. and. Uh, so there'll be more videos published or audio recordings published. Yes, and, and yeah. uh, you're going to re uh, keep them free. So if you go to rvsummit.com, there is some fantastic content there. He only asks for a blood sample and uh, <laughs> your, your bank account. If I'm kidding. <laughs> and if the, if the signal goes out again, our production assistant has just poured himself a glass of wine, and we're going to blame that. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you. We'll do it on there. Cheers. Grab, grab, grab a cup and let's toast. Let's have a toast to uh, good RVing and good yes. friends. And good yeah. friends and connecting on the road with people. Cheers.
Yes. This is this is what our thing is about, even though we're not in ours at the moment. <laughs> These are all fine. Yeah. Oh, wine. Oh, wine. Of course. Awesome. Wine, internet, and meeting awesome people in person that you only have to do really is the joy of this lifestyle. Um, so, now that our wine steward is back to his production assistant, <laughs> the roll. <laughs> all right. Our first question yeah. comes from uh, Mark, and uh, he says, "Have you considered any home automation tech that would alert you about temperature, moisture, et cetera, et cetera, when you are away?" We are actually evaluating such a product right yeah. now. We know where that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, we left it behind it to test remotely. I could see it, the temperature that our cat is experiencing at my parents' house, um, where she's being cats at, with Grammy out. It's a little AC box that plugs into your RV and will measure and send you text messages if the temperature goes too high or too low. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, an interesting product. We'll be writing about it fairly soon. Um, it's not actually as cool as I hoped. We've actually had better luck uh, leaving a, a camera behind, an iPhone behind, running the present software pointed at an indoor thermometer, and we so just checked check that out. Oh, that's a very clever idea. Yeah, yeah. Really sometimes right. it's you, you, if the, the product the, exists, doesn't isn't out there, or it's too expensive, or this one like it doesn't really meet our needs. Find a solution. There's what a great idea that is to point a camera at the thermometer. So. This but, is proof that 12 years in, you can still learn new things. I've never <laughs> thought of that. That's right. a great idea. <laughs> the, the nice thing, but a camera pointing at the thermometer isn't going to send you a text message saying it's getting it's hot. Something, so, but if we know right. it's hot out and we've left Kiki behind, we'll check we know to check hour. in. Because right. we're, we're always, I mean, she's always texting us anyway, saying, yeah. when's my next meal? So, you know, we're <laughs> always in communication. And I, I think in the, in the, there's a lot of Internet of Things, remote sensor type stuff that's coming to the home market. And I think some of this is going to get adapted to the RV market. Um, and over the next few years, I think it will be really a lot of cool things for remote monitoring and getting alerts and temperature warnings and stuff. And I'll be, I'm, I'm excited to look into that more. Mm -hmm. Sonia asks. Um, Hi, Sonia. Hi, Sonia. Uh, and it's kind of a long, open-ended question. But what do you do with your pets when you don't know how long you will be gone? Hmm. Leave a lot of food <laughs> <laughs> and a clean letter box. <laughs> So there's boarding options. Um, if we're going for, and like on this trip, we did not know when we left, we didn't really have a return booked. We were booked up back just back here to yeah. Vancouver. We we couldn't we didn't have enough food to leave two months worth of food <laughs> in the bus <laughs> or a big enough litter box. So yes. we, we found a trusted friend or family member who didn't mind a loosey goosey sort of schedule. So we coordinated with Chris's parents when we're planning when we'd actually return to St. Louis next week with their plans to make sure we weren't intruding and holding them back. Mm -hmm. um, so that was probably the best option is to leave them with friends or family. Um, it, or and also pet sending services pet, too. There are like, pet yeah. sending services. Uh, there was one time when we went, uh, that time we got the monthly rental and went on a cruise. Uh, we were parked with a bunch of friends who were gonna be around for a couple weeks and we gave them keys to the RV and they actually went in and spent time with Kiki. They loved cats so they went in and spent time with Kiki, made sure her robotic feeder wasn't out of battery power, despite what she would say, um, and take her for walks and, and keep her company. Yeah. So we would really, really love to have a cat, but one? part of the reason we don't involves the amount we travel, and we do travel away from the RV enough. We mm -hmm. try to travel internationally at least once every year to 18 months and see family a lot, and we can be gone from the RV two or three months out of the year can happen. So. Yeah, it, it is difficult. That is one of it's the trade-offs. With having pets in your life in RVing is you are limited just like you are in a house we would do a lot more international travel more things like we just did for the last two months um, it's not just the logistics of Kiki so we don't want to be apart from her that much she yeah. is our family so yes, missing a lot right now great uh, James asks um, he knows you you have a, a preferred repair location but if you were if you were planning vacation around a, uh, a repair, a longer term repair, are there any geographical areas or, or service stations you get more choice for leaving it? What type of repair? Yeah, if we can expand it on that because there, there are, we, we had a week long experience having an oil leak in our engine repair that was a very expensive, time consuming issue it turned out to be. That is different than having renovations done, for example. Right, if you're talking about RV stuff, um, Arizona in the winter, great location. No. Oregon in the summer, a lot of the RV techs, they kind of go between Oregon and Arizona. They winter and seasonally, so you can catch up with them there. And then, and then of course, Elkhart is kind Elkhart of ground zero for RV and, work. And, and we had it, renovation work done on the I-5 corridor in Oregon as well, and we had our new refrigerator installed. 
Right, and a lot of the Elkhart locations, they're open in the winter and are short on work. And if you want to take a winter vacation and you don't mind driving it up there, there's some great skilled folks up there that are so willing to do the work over the winter. Sometimes offering a preferable rate because yeah. they're looking for the work to carry yeah, you, through the If winter. you give them a six month project and say, hey, or a three month project, yeah. um, that gives them a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Good, here's a two part question from Tom and uh, Aaron, as well as uh, uh, John, I combined okay. them. It's about, um, uh, so storing for about three months or longer, is it, what's the best surface to store all your rig, concrete, asphalt, gravel, and also um, do you put your jacks uh, down and do you put the jacks on, you know, wood or We don't have jacks, so it doesn't apply to us. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is an eternal question. We get that a lot about whether jacks down, jacks up. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give one side of it, which is um, concrete by far is our favorite place to be. It uh, keeps things dry and protected. It's not bad for the tires. And we keep our jacks down when we are away from the RV. Most of the time, partly because uh, taking excess weight off the tires when they're gonna be sitting in one spot, not rolling for a long period, is good for the tire not to have more weight than necessary on them. We don't lift them off the ground. Right. But you're gonna hear, a lot of people are going to disagree with me on that and say, no, 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 you shouldn't extend your jacks because the springs will get stretched out. That, that is a consideration. A consideration. Which is cheaper to replace, the yeah, springs on the jacks or the, or the tires. tires. Right, and in this right. case, it's definitely the springs on the jacks. So, um, and, and for whatever it's worth, we are, our, our RV just turned 10 years old, our current RV, and we have never, I'm going to knock wood, we have not replaced the springs or had to do anything with the jacks. They still work fine. Right, afterwards. whereas a, a faulty tire can be a calamity on the road. On the road, or, right. Your jack springs right. going out, you just yeah. might that you might sleep a little on level yeah. for exactly. Right. Or have to use a two by four to pry it up the, if you were leaving a spot. The, the best thing I could possibly do in a perfect world is store indoors on concrete with the jacks down enough to unweight the tires. Correct. Right. Yeah. And right. now one thing, if you, if you are leaving it behind in a storage lot or something, it might be the rules, or it might just also be a good idea to leave it, everything set up so that things can be moved. Mm -hmm. um, because if you have a trailer or something, they might need to reshuffle things around the lot. And if you've got your jacks down, the, the, the person who goes out there with a little forklift to move something might not realize it, grabs the hitch and starts pulling and... Um, Suddenly you got a, yeah. you got a big repair item. Right, yes, so that's the point. And we also mentioned that we left our slides out while we're away for three days. That is something you would never ever do if you were in an RV park where you had very narrow spaces where people were parked very close to each other, if you were in an RV park like we are now, with a long-term stay with good spacing between the sites where no one could run into you while they're trying to park their fifth wheel, then you can yeah. really leave the slides out for short periods. Okay. Uh, Paul asks, uh, what measures do you take to prevent break-ins? Mm -hmm. I have good insurance. And, and insurance. we have remote surveillance. So yeah, we could get a picture of that. Yeah. Yeah. the yeah. armed drone. I think that's a pretty good deterrent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, it, it, and, and mostly, I mean, trust your gut. Of like, if you don't feel safe leaving something someplace, mm -hmm. definitely don't. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got heebie-jeebies about a storage lot or about a place that's like this doesn't feel well lit, this feels like you know there's graffiti on the rink park next to me, the storage lot. I'm not going to park my thing here. I'm going to go pay twenty bucks more a month and park someplace else. Yeah, it really does come down to some common sense of yeah you know, that that gut feeling. And we stored for uh, about two months one time when we had our RV on the East Coast in a very populated state with very poor driveway links for everyone we know. Lots of friends, no places to put it. Not a one. And we stored it in a storage lot that was secured with gates, cameras, fencing, and we felt comfortable. And insurance. And insurance. Yeah, and just be, be don't be as attached stuff as stuff. Yeah, have a good data backup for the stuff. And and well, and actually, also, I mean, this is something we did for leaving our our rig behind at a, a shop where it's going to be worked on. People are going to be in and out of it, and we needed to clear away space for both them to, to work and also for security. So we got a storage unit for the time that we are off away from our bus. I'm not necessarily sure that's safer than leaving it in the bus, though. That could easily, just as easily, be broken into. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. No, yeah, you could go find a more secure place to put stuff if you're going to be away for a while. And, and then again, the, the critical stuff, don't leave it behind if you're bringing it. Like we took our, our key critical backup drives and everything else and um, put but them we, somewhere completely. When we got the storage unit, though, we were really careful not to put the valuables in there because our insurance only covers a certain percentage of our personal belongings being outside the RV. Right. So Full-timers insurance covers the stuff yeah. in the rig more than outside of the yeah, rig. Yeah, there's, there's a certain percentage that is allowed to be outside. We knew we'd have our laptop and stuff with us, 
right. in the travel. So we already knew a good portion of it would be taken up of what we're carrying on our backs. So we only put the big bulky stuff in there that be in the way of our installers. Mm -hmm. it really, I mean, uh, in our experience, there's, there, there's not a lot of RV breakings that it, I mean, a lot of wood. You read about it more than you hear about it in yeah. person. Yeah, but it, it does happen. It does happen. It can happen. But don't live in fear. <laughs> yeah. Well, Geneva had uh, her name. I think Janet Genevieve had a, a follow-on question. Uh, she says, "Do you do anything special when you're leaving for like a day when you're boondocking? Anything different than?" Mm. Um, I, I know what the winds are. Yeah, um, I so always that, check the weather forecast. Um, mm. Especially out in the big desert areas where we do a lot of, a lot of wind docking is winds can kick up really, really right. fast. That's the biggest know, unexpected. Is uh, the awnings and lock it up. And, and, you know. and, and also then rain. Is there a chance of rain? Because you know, just for ventilation, I like to leave some of the windows cracked. But if there's a chance of a thunderstorm, I'm going to seal up the windows. The biggest thing really is pay attention to the weather forecast. <laughs> we watch the weather forecast constantly through like mental patients. <laughs> yeah, for these reasons. <laughs> Um, the rest of the questions are off-topic. Uh, sure, so that's fine. Sarah, you want to sure, we can do some off-topic now. And if anyone wants to ask other questions. So, uh, this is a prediction crystal ball question by Jeffrey. He says, what's your prediction on the timing of affordable lithium-ion batteries for RV battery banks? And <laughs> uh, uh, how old is Jeff? Yeah, define, <laughs> and also define affordable. Yeah, they're, they're already they're affordable. Sort of, so. <laughs> it, it, if you do the math, it's actually over the lifetime cost. Lithium now you can make a very strong argument is cheaper yeah. than lead for the yeah. lifetime. Mm. Oh really? That was. So that's, go, go, that's the GoPro battery. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so it's going to keep beeping. It's going to be. <laughs> no, you know, um, so if you go to technomadia.com slash lithium, our entire series is there. We did a, a cost analysis over doing AGMs versus lithium. Yes, the upfront cost is more, but if the benefits of them intrigue you, we actually find them to be in the affordable. They've even gotten more affordable, like with yeah. uh, suppliers like Dalcon, since we did ours. Mm -hmm. so. And here's a follow-on question that's. Uh, tied to the topic as well. Marshall asks, um, do lithium batteries require different long-term storage setup if you leave them? Oh, that, that is actually a good question. So ideally for, for lithium batteries, they're, they're long-term storage if, they're, if you're not gonna be doing anything with them. I believe, you know, check, always check with your battery manufacturer, but I believe the typical recommendation is to store them long-term to basically drain them to about 50% and then disconnect them. Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of self-discharge, so they can stay disconnected for a very, very long time without draining mm -hmm. themselves. But they're actually ha happier not being stored full. They're happier at 50%. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that, I mean, that, that, only worry about that for really long-term storage. Are there any temperature components in that? Or? You don't want to be cold. Well, well, actually, no, they, they, they can be hot or cold. You just don't want to charge them while they're, they're hot or cold. cold. Okay. Yes. Okay, now following along with the weather out the window, uh, uh, Sonia asked, do you, um, do you have a favorite app, uh, or they seem to be unreliable, do you have any favorite apps or websites? Or... I, I, I have to say, I have a thing I say about all weather forecasts, that the weatherman rarely knows what the weather was yesterday, let alone what it's going to be tomorrow, so we read lots of weather forecasts and try to err on the side of caution. But we like uh, dark sky, it gives us kind of uh, hyper local and hyper like what's going to happen in the next 15 minutes at your location. Uh, so we'll check that and see if there's any alerts for wind, rain, or something like that going on. And that's because it's crowdsourced, right? No, no, no. It's not, it's not, it's just they do models per oh. actually right where you're at. They, right. Rather than for the city of it's going to rain in Vancouver 50% chance, Dark Sky will say it, it's going to start raining in 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. like planning, a, a, you know, okay, well, I'm going to shut the, shut the windows even if I'm going out for a hike. It says it's going to rain in 45 I'm minutes. I'm not going out for a hike if it's raining in 45 well, minutes. Well, <laughs> 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 very good point. Um, and then what's the other one that Nina just turned you on? Uh, it's from Weather Underground and... Oh, yeah. Weatherbug? No, no, no I don't like Weatherbug much. Actually, it's on my phone right here. I'll pop up for a second. Full screen weather. No. Talk ahead, talk ahead for a second. This is yeah, if you go to like, technomadia.com, is it slash? It's my new favorite weather app. Favorite app. I don't know. There's a there's a page <laughs> oh, about see. apps. Yeah, yeah, Storm. It's called Storm. It's from Weather Underground. It's mm -hmm. a, um, I believe it's iPhone only. It might, might be on Android as well. But it is for weather geeks. It gives you all sorts of fun data to play with, and um, it's a really beautiful app. Storm. Cool. Yeah, we're getting thumbs up from quite a few people on Dark Sky. Dark yeah, Sky. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I like it. That's my other second favorite weather app. Very good. Um, uh, someone was asking about your favorite solar tr uh, controller. Victron. We're, we're big fans of Victron. I, I like their controllers, um, but there's 
you know, there's there's several other really good controllers out there, and there's also a lot of really awful controllers out there. So do your homework, <laughs> and um, yeah. Uh, here's a question for Peter. Uh, Peter, do you uh, VPN into your QSnap snacks? Ah, <laughs> that is <laughs> snap, snap. that is. Uh, I'm going to turn that over to the geekier of the RV geeks to answer any questions about technology and the QNAP. The uh, the QNAP does actually have the ability to, to uh, VPN in. Um, we are not using that feature uh, at the moment. I believe the uh, client end of it is Windows only. So we're Mac we people, are so Mac people. We're a little left out of that, but uh, it is available as an option. We don't do it. Right, and we've got since we it appeared in the video we did about uh, installing a Wi-Fi range, we've got a lot of questions about our QNAP. We may <laughs> we may <laughs> right. We have a 24 terabyte six bay uh, system. We may do a, a video about that. We have found it to be really excellent if you have a lot of storage capacity needed. I've got storage envy. We don't have nearly as many uh, terabytes as you. We've got a, we've got a, we've got a <laughs> wait, there's, wait, there's something that they have technology in. We want this on record. Uh, wait, wait, wait. We can go home now. I just I was waiting to find out. That's all we wanted to hear. Okay. Um, here's a, a very technical question from Jeffrey. At what voltage do you, do you have your auto gen start kick in at? And he says he knows it depends on the battery type of it in general. Is your voltage for auto gen start kick in? And also, just a quick warning on because we, we love and mostly know from the lithium perspective. On lithium, you've got to be very careful having any triggers tied to voltage. You have to actually have a smarter system that pays attention to the battery percentage because the voltage on lithium, the voltage curve is so yeah, flat. Most people out there are listening right. to lithium. The most common type of battery yeah. would, would, would be flooded lead acid batteries, which most people have and the vast majority of RVs come with. And we've Upgraded. Yeah, I was going to say, I was gonna say, regardless of the battery type, there's sort of, um, I, I vacillate back and forth on the setting for that actually because it's all based off of the voltage under load. Right. So it right. depends on what your battery state is at the time. So when we're on board and we're actually using the RV, I will set the voltage for the auto gen start lower because it's reading it under load while we're actually doing things, and I don't want the auto gen start kicking on prematurely because we've got a load on the batteries at the time. And also because it gives us a heart attack when it starts <laughs> up while we're on board. Because we're not used to it. So I will actually set in, in uh, for our batteries in about the 11.7, 11.8 range if we're looking at it from a, a loaded situation. Right, and we want to make clear on that. A lot of people are going to hear us say 11.7, 11.8 and say, well, you cannot take your batteries that low. Under load. Remember what John's talking about. He's talking about under load, not at, at rest. So at rest means no power coming in, no power, no power coming out, and in that circumstance, your battery should probably come on closer to twelve point one. Yeah, again, it depends on the battery type. Uh, AGMs are different than gel cells are different than right. flooded. Um, so again, in our particular situation, if we were away from the RV and I was only worried about parasitic drain then I would actually set the voltage higher around the 12.0, 12.1 range. Right. Because again, it's not going to be under a heavy load, so I want to make sure that it's kicking on before we get to that. Because we know that at that reading, they're at rest, and if they're 12.0, 12.1 at rest, it's time for the charger to come on. But there are a lot of better options out there, like a battery monitoring kit that's going right. to get you percent state of charge usage that you can yeah. use as your trigger. Which and we you, also have. And you can find find ways to integrate that in with your generator auto start, so Correct. your generator auto start is not just being triggered by voltage. Correct. Right. This is actually one of the last questions, so if people have more questions, they yes. need to ask. If you have more questions, yeah. queue them up. It's also made about an hour, too, so. It's a good time to wrap it up, too. Yeah. Uh, MB asked, this is from earlier in the conversation, what does triple charging with your solar panels mean? Triple charging means you have three panels. <laughs> <laughs> three panels, three batteries. Anybody want to address trickle charging? That's an easy one, yes. Um, draw so, us. <laughs> so, so trickle charging is like, think of like just a water, a, a trickle of water. It's a, it's, a, it's a slow charge. It's basically when somebody says they're trickle charging, they have a small solar panel that's just doing, kind of like keeping their batteries topped up. It's like a maintenance charge. Yeah, it's kind of a maintenance charge because batteries, when they're just left by themselves, will self-discharge is what they call it. They'll drain by themselves even if they're hooked up to nothing. So a trickle charge is the compensation for that. And very low uh, rate of charge. Yeah, very low rate of charge. The goal is if for batteries that aren't being used is just to keep them always at 100 percent. Right. And and those of you who have charging systems that use three-phase charging, which are the best systems that we're aware of out there, bulk is very high power absorb and then 
flow, flow, which is basically your trickle charge. It's uh, like Chris mentioned, you, yeah. and it's handled for you. Yeah. Right. It just and but if you if you consider the flow charge the trickle, it says the batteries are full. We're just so going to make sure they stay pulling. that way with a very small charge. The solar panels will keep them at 100 percent all the time. Yep. That's all it. right. Ah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you guys. Well, thank you. Hey, hey, we, we want to thank Chris and Sheree for <laughs> inviting us into their world of these live chats. Thank you so much. We want to thank you guys for coming out from behind the camera and showing your faces <laughs> and, and being awesome with us. Uh, well, thank you to Stephen for yes. moderating. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. It makes yes. it so much better. Um, we will announce our next chat. If you're not already signed up, uh, technomadia.com slash video will get you to our email subscribe list where you can be notified when we schedule our next chat. We do these about monthly. We pick a topic that we get a lot of questions on, and we're always happy to answer your questions in those sessions. And, well. and of course, our little plug, visit us at thervgeeks.com, and we'll show you how to turn the wrenches to do the things that Chris and Sheree recommend that you do. <laughs> And okay, we can actually give people a, a quick tour of our view as well. Oh, yeah, on the yeah, live yeah. camera now. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so you live audience, you can stay in when you stop the archive. Right. So archives.